Hello and welcome to Pneumothorax. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. Hopefully I can make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk about pneumothoraces. What is a pneumothorax? Well, this is a picture here of a closed pneumothorax. Okay, so that's one of the distinctions we need to make is between open and closed. Closed meaning that it's not open to the outside air, meaning through the chest wall. Obviously, it's going to be open to the outside air through the lung, but not through the chest wall. What happens with the pneumothorax is that we're getting air into the pleural cavity. So if you look at the left side, the normal lung there, you see it's fully expanded and there's a little bit of space around the lung and between the lung and the chest wall. That's called the pleural cavity. And in the pleural cavity, there's a little bit of fluid in there and a negative pressure, in other words, a vacuum. So it's like a suction, like your vacuum cleaner, that is pulling the lung up against the wall of the chest. That way, when the chest wall moves, when the diaphragm moves, the lung will follow suit, and the lung will expand and contract. What happens with the pneumothorax is we get some air into that pleural space. When air gets into the pleural space, we lose that vacuum that is pulling the lung open, so the lung is allowed to collapse. The normal state of the lung is collapsed. The reason why it stays open is because of that negative pressure, that vacuum that's pulling it open from the outside. So if we lose that vacuum in the pleural space, then the lung will collapse, and that's called a pneumothorax. This is an x-ray here of a patient who has a pneumothorax, has multiple fractured ribs and a pneumothorax. So if you take a look at the x-ray on the uh, what's listed here as the left side, it's the right side of your screen, we're going to have a full, nice expanded lung, fully expanded. We see the nice dark uh, lung space all the way uh, to the chest wall, all the way down to the diaphragm. Now if you look over on the left-hand side here, what you're going to see, first of all, if you look carefully at the ribs down toward the bottom on the right. You're going to notice there's multiple fractures of the ribs. So the, the last few ribs are all fractured. What we also see is that there is a very faint difference between that dark coloring that we see that should be in that space where the lung is. So we see a, an area toward the chest wall that is lighter in color than the area next to it. One of the ways that you can help to be able to pick up a pneumothorax when you're looking at a chest x-ray is you're looking for not only a distinction between a lighter and a darker area, but there is a very distinct line between the two. So it's not kind of fading from light to dark or dark to light. It's a very distinct line. So hopefully you can see that here in the, uh, di in the picture that you can see that there's a very distinct line. It's running through the right lung, which is on the left-hand side of the screen, and it's about midway through the lung. You see a distinct line going up and down between the darker area that's toward the middle and the lighter area that's on the lateral side. So I've highlighted it here. Hopefully that'll help to make it a little bit more obvious. So again, look at the left side of the line and it's lighter, right side of the line, and the lung looks darker. There are different types of pneumothorax as well. There is the spontaneous pneumothorax, there's the traumatic pneumothorax, and attention pneumothorax. So the spontaneous pneumothorax is a pneumothorax that occurs, as the name implies, spontaneously. So there was no trauma involved, just a little bleb on the lung, pops. This frequently happens in young adults. So we see the patient who is maybe in their early 20s. Um, we, we had one recently where a patient was, uh, it was an 18-year-old girl. They're sitting around watching TV. Suddenly she starts having chest pain and shortness of breath. By the time she gets to the hospital, she had a tension pneumothorax. So uh, that's, that can happen. Spontaneous pneumothoraces often reoccur. 
because uh, there are these little out pouches or these blebs that are on the lung that pop. Traumatic pneumothorax, as the name implies, is the result of some trauma. Attention pneumothorax, and I mentioned that with this example, attention pneumothorax is a pneumothorax that occurs uh, as a result of having not only losing the negative pressure in the pleural space, but gaining positive pressure in that pleural space. So it starts pushing the lung, the affected lung, into the mediastinum, compressing the heart, and then pushing the lung over toward the non-affected side. So let's take a look at each one of these. The first is the spontaneous pneumothorax. And again, there's no known cause. We, we think there are little bursts, blebs that are on the lung, these little outpouchings in the lung or a bleb, and that bursts. Uh, what we're seeing in the picture over here to the right is we're seeing a patient who has a chest tube in. So you see that line that goes uh, from the outside of the patient's body uh, over to the right side of your screen, and it moves toward the left side of the screen into where the lung would be. So it's actually in the pleural space, and it's sitting in there, and we hook it up to suction. So we hook that tube up to suction, and it's restoring the vacuum that is in the pleural space. You see some of the situations that are associated with spontaneous pneumothorax. Oftentimes it can be hereditary, so there can be a genetic link, and patients may say, well, yeah, my parents or my mom or my dad had one of those frequently when they were younger, and then it happened to them. Uh, one of the times you know, we mentioned here about elderly with COPD uh, may be at risk for developing a spontaneous pneumothorax, and, and you know that's because in COPD we have the destruction of lung tissue. Uh, but in our younger patients who have this burst bleb that occurs, we really don't have any warning or any indication that this patient may develop a spontaneous pneumothorax until it occurs. A traumatic pneumothorax can be classified as either being open or closed. So we saw a picture already, or an illustration, of what a closed pneumothorax would look like. So we have air leaking from the lung into the pleural space. What happens in an open pneumothorax is now we have air coming in from outside the thorax. So it's coming in the thorax. It's not going through the airways and out the lung. It's coming in the chest wall to go into the pleural space. So because air is moving into that pleural space, we lose the negative pressure of the vacuum that's in the pleural space and allows the lung to collapse. A tension pneumothorax, on the other hand, is a situation where the lung has a hole and it has a flap. Now this could be a hole and a flap in the lung or a hole and a flap in the chest wall. Either way, we're creating a one-way valve. The one-way valve is going to allow air into the pleural space and not allow that air to get back out again. So this will create a positive pressure. So positive pressure builds up in the pleural space, and then not only does it allow the lung to collapse, but the positive pressure starts pushing on the lung and making it collapse further. As that positive pressure builds, the lung will start pushing on the mediastinum, which will compress the heart, and we'll start to see some decompensation in our cardiovascular function. And eventually, it'll push so far over, it starts compressing the good lung. So as an illustration here, you see that air is accumulating in the pleural space, and maybe we have this one-way valve that's occurring. Air is getting out of the lung, but it's not getting back into the lung, so we're building up positive pressure. The uh, overall space on that affected side is starting to become larger because it's filling with air, compressing the lung and then pushing it into the mediastinum. This is a picture here of a patient who has a tension pneumothorax. Now, if you look at the x-ray, uh, you notice the little L at the top of the picture here. So that would be the left side, as if we're looking at the uh, patient's x-ray here straight on, and to the right side of our screen. So on the left side of the patient, right side of the screen, we have a normal lung, or a non-affected lung. And then on the left-hand side of your picture, or the right-hand side of the patient, we have a tension pneumothorax.
One of the clues here that this is a tension pneumothorax is look at how different the lungs look. So the lung that's on the patient's right hand side is very dark. So it's very dark, indicating lots of air. The lung on the patient's left hand side is more cloudy looking like you'd expect a normal lung to be because there's tissue in there. Now what's happening on the patient's right is that the pleural space is filling with air and it's pushing the lung tissue over into the mediastinum. Take a look at that heart. See how far the heart is pushed over into the left side? So that heart's really compressed. And you think about the normal shape of a heart. Take a look at the silhouette that we have here of the heart in this patient. The silhouette is showing a very compressed heart. So we're not getting blood back to the heart. The heart is not able to fill. It's not able to pump effectively. The patient's going to develop shock. So what ends up happening here is we see a patient who has respiratory distress followed by shock. That's how we would pick up the tension pneumothorax. In a patient who is developing shock, maybe the patient's had trauma, and we're trying to determine, is this attention pneumothorax or is this just maybe hypovolemic shock? Well, in hypovolemic shock, the patient is shocked first, then develops respiratory distress as a result of hypoxemia and a lack of perfusion. So what kind of symptoms do we expect to see in a patient who has a pneumothorax? Sharp, stabbing chest pain. Pleuritic in nature, sharp, localized, worse on inspiration. Dyspnea, cough, anxiety. Anxiety, the patient's going to be hypoxic. On exam, we would expect to see hypoxemia, cyanosis, possibly. Shock and attention pneumothorax. Asymmetrical chest expansion. So we listen for breath sounds, and we would expect that maybe we hear absent or decreased breath sounds on the side that has the pneumothorax. But if that pneumothorax is not huge, we may not hear absent or decreased breath sounds. In those cases, it can be very helpful to feel the chest for expansion. Put your hands on the patient's chest. Feel the expansion on each side. One side will have less chest expansion than the other as a result of not filling the lung as much. Dyspnea, tachypnea, accessory muscle use, tracheal deviation will also occur in attention pneumothorax as we start shifting that mediastinum to the unaffected side. Subcutaneous emphysema is possible. Subcutaneous emphysema is the loss of air from that pleural space into the subcutaneous tissue. Initially, that's going to go right around the wound or right around the area that's affected, and eventually that air is going to start moving outward. It's going to kind of move outward through the tissue, and it can go all the way through the chest area. It can go up to the neck, into the patient's face. We might be concerned if we're starting to feel subcutaneous emphysema up above the clavicles because now we're getting air that's starting to develop inside the subcutaneous tissue and there could be a possibility maybe of some issue with the patient's airway if we have enough subcutaneous emphysema developing around the neck area. Diagnostics, the first thing we're going to do is get a chest x-ray. We want to take that chest x-ray and see what's happening. See if we can see what's going on here. The, typically, the patient's going to present with having difficulty breathing. So we might suspect a pneumothorax, but it could be other things, too, that are causing the patient to have respiratory distress, especially in a patient who has a spontaneous pneumothorax. That's the kind of patient that you may not otherwise know. They're not having trauma. They just come in. They complain of chest pain and difficulty breathing. That could be a lot of things, including myocardial infarction. CT scan may be helpful in quantifying small pneumothoraces. So we want to quantify, find out how big it is, and whether or not we, we need to remove it. Small, C, er, small pneumothoraces, we're just going to leave them in place. We're not going to mess with them if they're not causing a lot of problem for the patient. Arterial blood gas may be helpful to find out whether or not there's any hypoxemia that's occurring as a result. 
Okay, in this situation here, we have a pneumothorax that has occurred in this patient. So you can see it here on the chest x-ray. I've kind of highlighted where that pneumothorax is. Uh, typically, air is going to move up to the top. So, And we see it here that air is formed in the upper part of the lung. So there is a, a demarcation that occurs here between the area below that red mark and the area above that red mark. And that's where the pneumothorax is. The other thing that you may notice, too, with this particular x-ray is where that diaphragm is supposed to be. So look at how much lower the lung goes on the patient's left or on our right and looking at the screen than it is on the left side. So I've highlighted here where the diaphragm should be on that screen or on that lung. But you see the lung is pushed down because there's air in the pleural space that's pushing the lung downward. And we see that drop in the diaphragm on that side as a result of that pneumothorax. So our treatment is going to be that we want to probably, in most cases, put in a chest tube. Uh, many spontaneous pneumothoraces may resolve without having any treatment at all. As a matter of fact, many pneumothoraces uh, may resolve uh, without treatment. So we may see one, we may say, well, it's small, let's just see how the patient does, let's leave it, it'll be reabsorbed on its own. Chest tube or chest drainage, if it's a chronic problem, we may put in a chest catheter instead of a chest tube. A chest catheter is much smaller. It's like the size of a large IV catheter, obviously longer, but it's about the size of an IV catheter. And it's put into the chest wall, into the pleural space, to remove air or move fluid on a chronic basis. Typically they're hooked up to a little container that uh, the patient may keep at their side and it just pulls out any air or any fluid that may be collecting over long periods of time. As an acute type of an event, we have put in a chest tube that looks something like this. So the chest tube is put into the patient's pleural space and then it is sutured in place. The patient may need oxygen or assisted ventilation and pain control. The pneumothorax itself may be painful. Chest tubes definitely are painful. So the patient may need some pain control as well. We typically will hook up that chest tube to a chest drainage system as illustrated here on the right. This is a Pluravac. There's many different types of chest drainage systems that are out there on the market. So it could be any of a number of different types that are used. Uh, check out our video on chest drainage if you'd like to find out more about how chest drainage systems work. Additional complications include infection, tumor, tension pneumothorax, or maybe poor gas exchange as a result of having this area of the lung being diminished. Well, thank you for joining me for Pneumothorax. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time... <laughs>